Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's update on COVID-19 in Alberta. With us today is the Minister of Health, Tyler Shandro, and Dr. Dina Henshaw, Chief Medical Officer of Health for the province. We'll begin today with remarks from Minister Shandro. Thank you, Tom. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you for joining me. Today, I'm pleased to announce yet another expansion of our testing capacity for COVID-19 here in Alberta. Since day one, testing has been a cornerstone of our pandemic response. And it's one of the many aspects of our response where we've been a leader in Canada and the world. We've performed more than 415,000 tests to date, and that number continues to climb every day. Our testing approach is a model for the rest of Canada, but we continue expanding. We continue improving our provincial capacity. And Albertans expect us to do everything possible to protect them from COVID-19, and we're doing exactly that. That's why I'm pleased to announce that people with no symptoms will soon be able to get tested in community pharmacies, making it easier for uh, uh, Albertans to access testing so we can continue to slow the spread of COVID-19 throughout our province. In the coming days, a number of community pharmacies with the skills and capacity will offer testing to Albertans without symptoms and no known exposure to COVID-19. This is in addition to the robust COVID-19 testing that's already offered province-wide by Alberta Health Services. Now, this is a step that just makes sense. Pharmacists are highly trained health professionals and pharmacies support the health care of residents in their communities every day. Testing is well within pharmacists' scope of practice and their competence. The pharmacy test is a throat swab which will be sent then to Alberta Precision Labs for analysis. Now, to ensure safety, participating pharmacies will receive specialized training and they will follow strict safety protocols. Over the next few days, 20 pharmacies will begin to offer this testing, mostly in Edmonton and, and Calgary. This will help us to uh, ensure here in Alberta that testing materials data and supports are working well before expanding this initiative further. And so we'll add more pharmacies in the coming weeks and I encourage anyone without symptoms to call their local pharmacy in the coming weeks to see if testing will be available there. But a reminder, if you have symptoms or were exposed to COVID-19, please do not go to your pharmacy, stay home, complete the online assessment, or you can call HealthLink at 811. And I'd like to be very clear about this as well. Community pharmacies are not replacing the testing that's offered by Alberta Health Services. This testing continues to be available across the province. It's free of charge. This announcement is yet another option to make testing as convenient as possible for Albertans. Whether you have symptoms or not, please get tested. It's a simple but important way for Albertans to protect themselves and others. The more test results we have, the more we know about how our communities are affected by COVID-19, and the more effectively we can respond. So thank you as always to each and every Albertan for continuing to, to work together to help keep themselves and uh, their community safe. Thank you. And I'd like to now ask Dr. Hinshaw to provide today's update on COVID-19. Thank you, Minister, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm pleased to report today that 7,191 Albertans have now recovered from COVID-19. We've conducted more than 6,300 new tests and have identified 26 more cases in the province that happened yesterday. Currently, 38 people are hospitalized with COVID-19, including eight who are currently in the ICU. I must report one new death in Alberta, bringing our total lives lost to 154. This death is linked to the outbreak in a unit at the Misericordia Community Hospital. Six patients and five staff have now tested positive for COVID-19. My colleagues have assured me that outbreak measures are in place and aggressive testing is underway. All patients on the affected units and staff who have either worked on or been present on those units are being tested even if they do not have symptoms. This is yet another reminder that COVID-19 can be a very serious illness. My condolences go out to all those who are grieving this new death. As Minister Shandro said, 
Testing is one of the most important tools we have to keep Albertans protected. And we know that strong testing data helps us understand how our communities are affected by COVID-19. With pharmacists starting to perform the testing, this means people have options closer to home. I want to make sure that we remember it is particularly important that anyone who has symptoms that could be related to COVID-19 get tested. I have heard some reports lately of people with symptoms who don't want to be tested as they are afraid of the stigma they might face if the test comes back positive. This is an important concern to address. We will only be successful in keeping COVID-19 spread manageable if we are able to use evidence-based interventions such as contact tracing and self-isolation of close contacts. I know that it can be uncomfortable to be in this position, whether you are a case or a close contact. I also know that by being tested and participating with public health follow-up, this makes a difference and protects your community. If you are feeling ill, getting tested is the right thing to do, both for yourself and for those around you. With Canada Day approaching, I want to remind all of us that COVID-19 is still very much a threat to Albertans, young and old. I know many people are tired of following health measures and physical distancing, particularly as the risk of severe outcomes is lower for those under 60 years of age. However, a lower risk does not mean there is no risk at all. In fact, the majority of active cases we have identified in recent weeks are in Albertans under the age of 40. At this time, the average age of COVID-19 infections in Alberta is 39. No one is immune to COVID-19, and currently there are four Edmontonians in hospital under the ages of 30. These patients do not have any underlying health conditions, and yet they are very sick. This is another reminder that COVID-19 does not discriminate. Another example is the outbreak at the high-rise apartment building in Calgary that I mentioned last week. This outbreak will be listed online tomorrow. There are now 32 cases associated with the outbreak, including three in hospital, who were otherwise healthy individuals. I want to say again that we should all be grateful to everyone who has been tested and who is participating in public health follow-up. We should not stigmatize or blame these individuals as any of this kind of negative attention discourages others from being tested or working with public health. That would only make things worse. This outbreak is a reminder that indoor areas pose unique risks of transmitting and this virus can spread easily from one person to many if given the opportunity. So in the lead up to Canada Day, as you're making plans to celebrate with family and friends, please consider the steps you can take to minimize the risk. Make sure you keep at least two meters, about the length of a hockey stick, away from people outside your household or cohort family. Wash or sanitize your hands after touching common touch surfaces. Wear a mask when distancing is not possible. And if you need information on proper mask care and use, you can visit alberta.ca backslash masks. The risk of spread is lower outdoors, so if the weather permits, I suggest celebrating outside within your cohort. If your backyard is too small for appropriate distancing, perhaps you could meet at a park or explore one of the many green spaces that Alberta has to offer. Please avoid barbecues and potlucks because shared containers and serving utensils can be a source of infection. This year, it's a good idea for everyone to bring their own food and drinks. And if anyone disagrees with that, you can blame me for that recommendation. I know this may not be the Canada Day you had envisioned, and I know this is frustrating for many, but we have seen that a single barbecue can spark a wide number of cases. We've seen that a single individual who may not even know they have the virus can infect a large number of their friends, co-workers, or neighbours. The virus is still here, and we know gatherings can help to spread it. Always watch for COVID-19 symptoms in yourself and others who rely on you for their care. If symptoms develop, you must isolate and book a test online. COVID-19 loves a party, so we can't let our guard down. We truly are in this together, and we need to make sure we protect each other as much as possible. 
Please keep this in mind as you plan your summer activities. Thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions. All right, we'll go to the phone now. Operator, could you put through the first caller, please? Our first question comes from Julia Wong of Global News. Your line is open. Hi, I have a question for Dr. Hinshaw and a question for Mr. Shandro. So for Dr. Hinshaw, the BC Premier is welcoming Albertans to visit this summer. What is your reaction to that and your advice to Albertans? And is that same welcome being extended to British Columbians to come to Alberta? And for Minister Shandro, how will these uh, 20 pharmacies be chosen and ultimately how many pharmacies will be offering testing? Will there be a cap on how many pharmacies are picked and do you expect that that testing to continue indefinitely? So for the question about BC, I've had many conversations with my colleagues in BC, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, uh, and we have never made any kind of formal restriction in terms of limitations or quarantine on people crossing from BC uh, to Alberta or Alberta to BC. Uh, what we have done is we've just had recommendations that people stay closer to home this summer and limiting non-essential travel outside the province. So we are continuing to have conversations with respect to whether or not at a certain point we could ease back on that general recommendation. Uh, we haven't made a formal decision at this point, but again, I would um, remind Albertans that the, the more travel and the more people that all of us are exposed to, uh, that just provides more risks for exposure. And so while there is no formal requirement uh, or restriction on crossing the border into BC or Saskatchewan, uh, we continue to recommend that you plan your holidays in the province this year, and if that changes, we will definitely let you know. Uh, thank you. And for the uh, the question regarding the uh, the 20 pharmacies uh, that are being identified now and how it would be um, unrolled going forward, um, so and we considered whether or not to to make it uh, announced here today with the the 20 pharmacies that are going to be. Our, our focus right now is. Because this is a pilot project, we want to make sure that the uh, the 20 pharmacies that we're starting off here with this pilot project are going to have the capacity, as well as the training right now, to uh, for this uh, this pilot project. And then, when we see success, being able to work with uh, pharmacies in, in Alberta and being able to ensure that they have the uh, the capacity and the training as well uh, going forward. So uh, that that's what we're going to be focused on uh, is is just making sure that there's capacity and and training and that uh, those pharmacies are able to do that. Um, for any for the details of um, the the enrolling of, of the pilot, Dr. Inshaw, if you want to speak about the details, then. Sure, thank you. So uh, as the Minister mentioned, it's really important that as we move forward with this expansion of locations where testing can happen, we're working through those protocols about the infection prevention control measures that need to be taken, transporting the swabs and materials from the lab to the pharmacies, transportation going from the pharmacies back. We're working with pharmacies to ensure that we have a a uh, common understanding there, there needs to be a certain number of swabs taken per day so that that uh, transportation can be efficient in making sure that the swabs get back to the lab on time. And so there, those are the, all of those details that we're going to be able to work out uh, with those first 20 pharmacies. And again, the, those sites are really uh, chosen with respect to the willingness to work together with government uh, where we can work out those details. And once we have those details tested, it, and uh, sorry, tested and tried out, then we'll be able to roll out to other interested pharmacies who can meet those requirements for infection prevention control protocols and the minimum number of swabs that need to be taken in a day to make sure that the process is efficient and effective in terms of that transportation time. Operator, can you put through the next question, please? Our next question comes from Kevin Nimick of CTV. Your line is open. Hi, Dr. Hinshaw. Can you please confirm the number of cases tied to the Verve condominiums outbreak in Calgary? Uh, what's been done to keep people safe in that uh, location, and do you expect there to be many more cases from this outbreak? So the, uh, the Verve condominiums, there are 32 cases, uh, 27 of which are active and five of which have recovered. Uh, it's really important, it sounds like you've perhaps been in touch uh, with someone at that building and you're mentioning the name. I want to emphasize and underscore the importance of not stigmatizing any particular location or group of people. 
uh, because it's really critical that whoever has come forward and been tested and participated with public health follow-up uh, does not suffer negative consequences as that will unfortunately uh, potentially deter others from, from going forward and being tested. What has been done for this particular building is uh, public health at that local level is working very closely with building management. Uh, they're making sure that there's enhanced cleaning, they've offered testing to everyone in that building whether or not they have symptoms. And so I think the, the question of whether or not we're likely to see additional cases uh, it's possible, but I do believe, again, that every measure that needs to be taken to prevent spread is being undertaken. And as I mentioned, uh, when I previously mentioned this particular outbreak, uh, at the moment it does seem that possibly high-touch surfaces are a mechanism that's still being explored. Uh, but again, all of the, the, um, the uh, measures that need to be put in place to prevent transmission are being put in place and Alberta Health Services is working with that group of people uh, and getting a lot of support from that local management group. All right, we'll go to the phone again. Operator, could you put through the next question, please? Our next question comes from Jamie Malbuf of CBC. Your line is open. Hi, this question is for Dina Hinshaw. Um, the 30 seniors in the home are just being tested today. What kind of impact will that two-day wait time um, have on spread in these long-term care facilities? Sorry, Jamie, we lost the first part of your question. Could you try that again? Sure, yeah. So uh, a Fort McMurray senior's home has had its first case of COVID-19. It was discovered on Tuesday, and the 30 seniors in the home are just being tested today. So what kind of impact will these wait times for testing have on the spread of COVID-19 in long-term care facilities? When an outbreak is identified at any continuing care facility, the first thing that's done is outbreak protocols are put in place to prevent any further spread. And that doesn't depend on the results of that further testing. So the fact that this outbreak was identified on Tuesday, I believe there's a, a single case in that particular outbreak uh, with one staff member. So it needs to be really clear that at this point, there's no evidence that there has been spread of virus within the facility itself. There's only one staff member who's positive. And as a precaution, of course, we offer testing to any residents and staff in an outbreak setting so that if there does uh, happen to be an additional case, we can pick it up as early as possible. However, I want to underscore that this is in addition to all the typical outbreak measures, not a replacement for. And so those outbreak measures would have been put in place on Tuesday. Uh, and so any kind of spread within that facility would have been minimized by those measures. And this additional testing that's happening now is again, uh, just one additional layer. And I don't expect that that two day um, time period would have a significant impact on the ability to control spread in the facility. Operator, can you put through the next question, please? Our next question comes from Michael King of Global News. Your line is open. Hi, Dr. Hinshaw. If families who are not cohorting together want to get together, say for Canada Day, one person from each family gets tested, does this mean, and everything comes back negative, does this mean that some of those rules around like bringing your own food could maybe be relaxed? The challenge with testing uh, and using that as a, a metric for whether or not a, a whole family is a quote unquote safe or uh, whether or not even that person who's tested is again kind of quote unquote safe uh, for the days after they were tested. The challenge is that this swab test really is only a snapshot in time. So a negative test result will say that those two individuals who got tested at the time that the swab was done had no virus that was detectable in their throat or their nose depending where the test was taken. It doesn't guarantee whether or not that person might have been exposed prior and incubating the virus. Uh, it doesn't guarantee whether or not other people in the household are uh, also negative at the time of the gathering. So that's why the recommendation of trying to stick within those cohorts, we have expanded that cohort definition to include up to 15 people outside the household. And the recommendation is if you're going to be gathering and perhaps sharing food or 
uh, not observing that physical distancing, that it be within those cohorts. And if you want to gather with other people, the recommendation remains, uh, independent of those testing results, that you would continue to follow all of those protocols with respect to distancing, bringing your own food, and uh, enjoying each other's company outdoors if possible and from that distance of two meters. Operator, can you put through the next question, please? Our next question comes from Shannon Scott of CBC. Your line is open. Oh, hi, Dr. Hinshaw. Um, I had a question about long-term care as well. Uh, Kai Hai has released this snapshot report today showing uh, the percentage of, of Canadians and Albertans that have died of COVID-19 in long-term care. We know that uh, those kinds of facilities have been very hard hit in our province. I'm wondering what uh, you and your department have learned uh, about things that you might do differently next, as we potentially head into a second wave when it comes to keeping infections out of long-term care facilities. That's a great question. I haven't had an opportunity to look at the Kai Hai report yet. I know that our statistics that we had done up a couple of days ago indicated that 77% of the deaths we've had in Alberta have been in continuing care settings. It is a very high risk setting for individuals who live there, both with respect to spread of the virus in that communal setting, as well as high risk for severe outcomes for those who are older and have medical conditions and live in those settings. So that's why we've taken a number of the measures that have been put in place with respect to having staff working only at one long-term care or designated supportive living facility and not being able to move between them. Also making sure that there's rigorous screening of staff members when they enter for symptoms or COVID exposures. That residents have daily symptom screens so that if there is a case of COVID that it can be detected as soon as possible. And we have had very rigorous visitor restriction policies in place for many months now. We have been doing a series of town halls this week to hear from residents, operators, and family and friends of those who live in continuing care to understand what measures we might be able to ease slightly with respect to the visitor restrictions while still keeping residents uh, as safe as possible. Because we know that while what we've learned from our experiences is that introduction of COVID-19 into one of these facilities can spread extremely fast and have tragic and devastating consequences. We also know that the very strict restrictions that are in place right now for all those who live in these settings is having other kinds of health impacts. And so with respect to a second wave, I would say we can't relax our guard even tomorrow. Uh, a second wave could happen as soon as all of us start to ignore the public health restrictions, a uh, second wave is not guaranteed to happen only in the fall. So we need to keep our guard up in all of our, all parts of our lives, not just in continuing care. So I think with respect to preparing for a second wave, essentially what we're doing is keeping the restrictions in place that are the most effective means of protecting residents while looking at ways to improve quality of life uh, through some measures that we might be able to ease off slightly with respect to visitor restrictions. And I think the minister can supplement that answer. Thank you, and, and thanks for pointing out the, um, the, the numbers from, from Kai Hai. I think it's also important for us to think of it also not just on a percentage basis, but also just remember what the mortality rate is in continuing care facilities throughout Canada. If we look at the mortality rate on a per one, uh, one million basis, um, in Canada, that mortality rate in continuing care is uh, 142 people per million um, for, for people who have uh, been lost to, to COVID-19. Now here in Alberta, it's 23. That, that's not, not 123, it's 23. And I, I think that speaks volumes to the success that we've seen here in Alberta, um, the success that uh, we've seen uh, throughout the system from everyone in, in, in Dr. Hinshaw's office to the, the folks who are doing the contact tracing, the folks who are doing the testing, to the folks who are doing the work in our 400 continuing care facilities throughout the province, um, and uh, the, the amazing success that they've seen. Uh, now our heart goes out to, to anyone who, who's been lost to, to COVID-19, uh, and especially those who have lost a loved one who's been a resident um, uh, in a continuing care facility and who's lost that loved one. 
but uh, I think we have to remember that uh, we've seen, uh, especially compared to the rest of Canada, here um, uh, significant uh, uh, success here, here in Alberta compared to the other jurisdictions. All right, I think we've got time for three more. Operator, could you put through the next one, please? Our next question comes from Jason Herring of the Calgary Herald. Your line is open. Hi there. Uh, first, just a real quick question, wondering how uh, how much the testing capacity is as far as a, a number now. Uh, secondly, wondering, since uh, some movie theaters around Alberta are opening uh, tomorrow, whether there's a recommendation from the province to wear masks or any other recommendations about uh, behavior while going to the movie. Sure. Uh, I'll, I'll let Dr. Hinshaw answer that second question. Uh, for the first uh, answer, and we have to remember that this is a function of a, a bunch of different things. It, our testing capacity in the province is a function of our workforce capacity, um, our supply capacity, so the number of swabs that we can um, uh, produce in a given day, the amount of reagent that we have as well, uh, the equipment capacity that we have, because we've invested significantly in a lot of new equipment throughout our response to COVID, um, and as well the, the intake capacity we, that we have um, uh, through the, the online assessment tool, the, uh, the, the, the phone appointments, people coming into the assessment centres, they get um, tested. So that right now is at 16,000 uh, tests per day that, that can, can be done. Um, and uh, maybe I'll, I'll let uh, then Dr. Hinshaw answer that second question, or if you also have anything else to supplement. Thanks, Minister. I think you covered the, the first question. Uh, with respect to the question about movie theatres, I would recommend that if someone is going to a movie theatre and you're not sure that you're going to be able to be two metres distant from others outside your household or cohort family at all times, then wearing a mask would be the prudent thing to do. We know that indoor spaces, again, are a higher risk than outdoor, and especially if you're in a theatre watching a, a movie where there might be people laughing heartily or there might be um you know if it's a an action movie if people are going to be shouting i don't know you may want to wear a mask again not just to protect uh yourself but to uh, protect those around you if you're going to be in that kind of closed space so i think it would be a prudent thing to do especially if you're not certain that you'll be able to stay that distance apart from others at all times operator could you put through the next question please Next question comes from Emily Mertz of Global News. Your line is open. I uh, just had a question regarding the outbreak at the MIS. Um, is it still contained to one unit, and have any units or procedures been affected or postponed? And then the second part of that, maybe, I don't know if uh, Dr. Jaffe is there, but just are there any concerns that the small group of occupational health nurses that are doing the contact tracing for the Covenant staff involved in that outbreak, um, that they will be overwhelmed by the outbreak, and what support is that team getting? So I can answer the first question. Unfortunately, Dr. Jaffe isn't here today, but we can have uh, talk to AHS and follow up on that second question. So at the moment, there are two units that are affected. There's one unit where the majority of cases are, and there was a patient who was on that affected initial affected unit transferred to another unit who's now positive. Uh, so the main impact has really been on those particular units with respect to pausing any admissions or transfers. Uh, as far as I'm aware, there's been no cancellation of procedures. However, we can confirm that uh, and get back to you, and we'll also get back to you on that second question. All right, we'll Pat, put through our final answer question now, please. Our final question comes from Matt Woodman of CTV. Your line is open. Hi, Dr. Hinshaw. I also have a question uh, regarding the Misericordia outbreak. I'm just curious. You might have mentioned this, but I, I might have missed it. Uh, how many, uh, at last check, we had six patients infected and two staff members. Is there an update on those numbers? And I'm also wondering, the, the uh, person who died related to COVID-19 at the MIS, was it a patient? There are currently six patients and five staff members who are confirmed cases and the death was in a patient, that's correct. I, I do want to make a point about that outbreak to remind people that we've been in this COVID response uh, for almost four months now, and this is the first time that we've had an acute care outbreak where transmission has occurred within that facility from uh, that's affected patients. We have had a few other acute care outbreaks that have been declared as a, either a precaution 
uh, or where there's been some staff to staff transmission. But I want to make sure that it's clear that uh, I don't want people to fear going to seek health care because of this incident. This is an isolated incident. It's being investigated. And to have one outbreak in four months in acute care is uh, very low uh, risk. So I just think it's really important that people remember that. All right. Thank you for joining us today. Dr. Nishab will provide another update on Tuesday afternoon. Thank you.